Amen. The Lord is so good to us, isn't He? Yes. Yes. He's been good to you this week. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Amen. I love you folks. I appreciate you a whole bunch. And, uh, don't give these singers and musicians a good hand. Yeah. Now that you all these cooks and all these people are a good hand. Yeah. Let the hospitality director in the kitchen know that you appreciate him. Yeah. But uh, the Lord's good to us, isn't He? Stand with me tonight, if you will. I'm going to take just a few moments here. In uh, St. Mark chapter number 2. St. Mark chapter number 2. I'm going to read this story here, just a few verses. Starting verse number 1. And again he entered in Capernaum after some days, and it was reported that he was in the house. It's a good thing when Jesus is in the house. Amen. Amen. And straightway many were gathered together in so much that there was no room to receive them. Yeah. No, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. And they come unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. And when they could not come near unto him for the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. And when they had broken it up, they let down the bed in which the sick of the palsy lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, He said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins are forgiven thee. But there was certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, Why doth this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God? I'm glad I got my sins forgiven tonight. How about you? Yes, Amen. And immediately when Jesus perceived in His Spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, he said unto them, Why reason ye these things in your heart? Which is easier to say to the sick of the palsy, Thy sins are forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and take up thy bed and walk, that, that ye may know that the Son of Man has authority on the earth to forgive sins? He said unto the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise and take up thy bed and go thy way into thine house. And immediately he arose and took up the bed and went forth before them all in so much that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw it in this fashion. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank You, Lord, for this day. We thank You for everything that You've given us. Lord Jesus, we ask if there's anything in our life that's contrary, or anything that's displeasing, or anything sinful, Lord, I ask that it's the whole entire congregation's prayer here tonight, that you would forgive us, Lord. Let nothing stand in the way of your word. But Lord, let us be touched by you. And we want to thank you for everything that you do for us. Thank you, Lord, for those that you're healed, those that you're touching and moving upon their lives. And Lord, we give you the glory and the honor for all of it. And we'll ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Isn't the Lord good to us? He is good. Amen. The Bible talks about here in this story in the Bible about the paralytic man that was healed and it's told in several places in the in the Bible and in the Gospels there about the man who who was paralyzed, the man who could not walk, and how he was carried by four men into the presence of Jesus. First of all, as we begin to read this this story in here, we, we find out that the fame of Jesus had spread all out. Jesus has been doing some wonderful things that are extraordinary, some miracle things that, that people have never seen before. And so anywhere that Jesus was going, it was the Word was sent ahead and rumors were spread, which weren't rumors, which was fact, but that people knew that if they could get to Him, that they would be healed. We read the story a few weeks ago about blind Bartimaeus, how he sat by the roadside. Listen, he didn't pick any old random roadside. He picked a roadside he knew that Jesus would be coming down. And he was going to yell and holler until he got his attention because he wanted to be healed from blindness. Amen? Same way with the story about the little widow woman who, who uh, said that had the issue of blood and she'd spent everything she had. And she made up her mind and she said, If I can but touch the hem of his garment, I know that I'll be made whole. And the Bible actually teaches word that this lady had to do something. She couldn't just sit in the house and just simply say, I believe. No, she 
pressed her way through the crowd. Her faith had some legs on it. How many of you know tonight that if you've got faith in Christ, that you've got to have some legs in your faith? Your, your faith is proven by your works. Now, I know that that sounds contrary probably to everything that you've ever heard me say about works because you cannot work your way into the kingdom of God. You cannot work your way into pleasing God. But because I've been saved, listen, because I've been saved, because He's washed away my sins, because He lives in my heart, it's not that I have to do it, it's that I want to do it. Amen? Amen. It's like somebody said, I'm scared to death to become a member of the church, or I'm scared to death of this because I'm, I'm afraid I'll have to start tithing, or I'll have to start giving. And I've always said, no, you don't have to do that. You don't have to do that. You don't have to do that the more you have to speak in tongues. But the thing about it is, you get to. You're privileged to. You're privileged to. You're part of God's plan, part of... Part of what God has set in motion. And He says, you bless me, I'll bless you. Because you get to it. It's not that God ever forces anything on anyone. But He opens up the door and allows you to do it. And allows it to be real. Not drummed up, not fake, but for real. And here's a story about a man who was paralyzed who could not get to Jesus. Now the story goes on and it says that, that it was told that he was in the house and, and there was people that crowded all around that house that just flooded that house so that they, they couldn't even get this man to Jesus because he was in there teaching the Word of God. He was in there teaching the Gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what he was doing. He was teaching... He was, he was straightening out some things between the scribes and the doctors of the law and stuff like that. He was revealing himself really unto, unto this crowd of who he was. Not all at once, but slowly but surely, Jesus was exposing who that he was. The King of kings, the Lord of lords, the one who created it all. Religious people have a hard time learning things. Because when you become religious and you, and, and I, I don't want to use that term broad brush, I, I want to say that whenever you become set in your ways to where you become unteachable by God, some people might call it narrow mindedness, but even though that's a bad description, because I'm narrow minded. I'm narrow minded into how to get to Jesus. I sat with a man uh, not too awful many nights ago down in Woodstock. And, he began to explain to me how that he thought that, that all roads led to God, that all religions led to God. And I just had to stop up and back and say, oh no, 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 don't believe that. I said, because, listen, I believe what the Bible says. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life, and no man can come unto the Father but by me. So I told him, I said, so that narrows the field down a whole lot to this Jesus. So whenever it becomes narrow-mindedness, I, I qualify because I believe Jesus yes. is the only way unto God the Father. Religion in itself cannot get you to God. And we define religion in a lot of different ways. I grew up in an era whenever you, if you talked about a person that had religion, it meant a good thing. It wasn't a bad thing. When you said somebody got religion, you could have been talking about anybody that, that got their heart right with God and, and, and got saved. And You know, you heard him say it. I, I remember uh, there was a lady that, that my mother and them used to go to their house and they would play uh, music at their house and and Mama would talk about how that when you went to the house that there was a lot of people there that was drinking and that there would be this bar and there would be everything across this bar. Jack Daniels, Jim Beam, every kind of whiskey, every kind of beer that you could think of. And they had a house full of musicians and they were, they were dancing and they were partying and they were having a good time. But when that man who was the head of that household got saved... When he come to know Jesus, Mama said, it was just like you had flipped the light switch on. The next time they went up there, it was completely cleaned out. 
There wasn't a beer. There wasn't a bottle of whiskey. There wasn't anything to be found inside that house that had anything to do with that former life. And, and I remember hearing them say, well, Jack got religion. And that was a good thing because they defined religion as not as this trying to work toward it or not being this, this, uh, this ill person that's just all the time pointing the finger and saying you're not living right. But their definition of getting religion was he got saved. He got the goods. He got Jesus in his heart. And so when we began to look at that, that older generation, a lot of times they would say he got religion and it doesn't mean a bad thing. At all. And so Jesus is in there and he's he's teaching the ways of God. He really, he really just bypassed a whole lot of stuff to try to show them who he was and what he was going to do. And so they were interested. And the crowds came and you couldn't get around the house. You couldn't, you remember when we first started this this uh, prayer meeting over there on Beth Avenue. You remember the second time we ever met? There were so many people there they could not get them all inside the house. And so the, the third time we met, we went outdoors because of all the people that came that couldn't get in the house over there at Beth Avenue. It was a wonderful, wonderful time of God moving on people's lives and them coming. And this is what is happening here is that Jesus is in the house and He's teaching and He's preaching the Word of God and people are interested. And you know, with one part of this, when you begin to read this story in Luke, it talks about as Jesus was there teaching that the, the power to heal was present. Now it doesn't say in Luke that Jesus was healing anybody. It says in Luke that the power to heal was present. And I say that because of the Word of God, because of the Word of God being taught and the anointing of the Holy Spirit all over Jesus, that the power of people to be healed was present. How many people do we know of that whenever God moves and there's this this, uh, this tangible presence of, of Christ in the midst and all of a sudden that person is healed. It didn't take a preacher. It didn't take a, a Benny Hinn or a Kenneth Copeland or, or you know a, a Rod Parsley or some of the rest of them that, that are heroes on television. It was simply the presence of God that showed up and somebody said, I, I feel something has happened to me and I've been made whole. And so there would have been this this presence, this presence of the Spirit as Jesus was there ministering inside His house. But listen, these four men grabbed up this paralytic man and they was going to bring him to Jesus. And, and they tried to get to him and they couldn't get to him. And I like how one old preacher put it years ago. He said that uh, he said if this would have been nowadays, we would have gotten up a committee somewhere. We would have gotten a committee. He said, I heard the old preacher one time, he said, you know what a committee is? A committee is a, is a group of fellows that, that takes down minutes and kills hours to do it. Amen. I, I thought that might sink in there for really for just a minute. Because it is the truth. I mean, you, you get two horse flies on the rear end of a horse and you've got a committee. You've got something that's organized going on. You really do. <laughs> and if this would have been the modern day church and Jesus would have been in the middle of it they would have went and got the door committee and they would have said can we get him in the door and there would have been a committee meeting and they would have all voted and they'd said no we can't get this man in the door we can't get him inside the door because the door is crowded with people and we're not sure that we can come to a vote to get this thing straightened out to move these folks. And so then they would have moved on to the window committee. <laughs> Maybe the window committee could get it done. And so the window committee would have got together and they would have walked around the house and they would have heard the voice of Jesus speaking, but they would have still been past all the crowds and looking around and they would have said, well, I don't think we're going to be able to get him into a window either because of the, of the crowds. I don't think that a window's going to work. But, but luckily, fortunately... The, the roofing committee was there. And so here's some old guys that, that pick this boy up and they take him up on the roof and they remove the tiles from the ceiling. Did you know sometimes you've got to bring somebody 
to the place of Christ. Sometimes you've got to be the roofing committee. Sometimes you've got to invite people to the prayer meeting so that they can get the gospel. Let me tell you something. There's a world out there that is hungry for God. Yes, yes. I am so shocked by people I meet and I'll start to tell a Bible story and they've never heard it. They've absolutely never heard it. I, I tell you what, I was with two Mormon boys um, a few days ago and they came up to me and we started having a conversation. And I was sweet to them because I think that one of the worst things that a child of God can ever do is be ugly to anybody. I don't care who they are. Jesus didn't give you an ugly spirit. He gave you a tender spirit. Because here was two guys that I saw that was out pedaling bicycles, trying to work for God. And, and, and folks, they were doing a lot more than people that's been in an established church is doing for years. But I, I, I sat there and... and, and started talking with them and I, and I started explaining the cross of Jesus Christ and what it meant and, and, and how it included so many things within Christianity. And, and it was almost like I was speaking a foreign language to them. And I told these boys, I said, look, Jesus ain't knocking on the door of the established, organized church. He's not doing that. He's not down at the Baptist or the Methodist or even your Mormon Lord. He's not there knocking on the door. The book of Revelation says, Behold, I stand at the door knocking if any man open the door. So he's not dealing with the established organization. He's dealing with an individual on an individual basis. He knocks on our heart and he says, If you'll open that door, I'll come in unto you. Yes. And I was speaking a foreign language to these guys. I was speaking Greek to them. Because they had never ever heard it put that way. That this relationship with Jesus Christ is personal and, and it's not about the things you do and it's not about uh, God is keeping score with how much you do. But it's who you believe in and the relationship that you have with Him in your heart that makes you free from all sin. And I was telling them, I said... That's how come you can be made free from alcoholism. That's how come you can be made free from drugs. That's how come you can be made free from addictions. Honey, we're not in the recovery business. We're in the deliverance business. Amen? Recovery business is down there in the hospital somewhere when somebody's done something to you and they roll you into a room, they stick needles in your arm and they give you a little, they give you a little nourishment and you're in the room recovering from something drastic that's happened to your body. But when Jesus Christ gets a hold of your life and what He done on the cross of Calvary and you yeah. believe in Him, there's not a workbook, there's not a recovery, there's deliverance in the cross yeah. of Jesus Christ. He yeah. delivers. Yes. He delivers on the cross. Yes. And so they bring this old boy into Jesus and they lower him through the ceiling. And the Bible says that Jesus, it wasn't that man they carried in's faith that he saw. It was the one who brought him's faith that he saw. And you know, that's what you and I have got to do. You and I have got to go out and invite people, pray for them, talk to them about Jesus. Invite them to your church where you go. You don't have to invite them to the prayer meeting. I, I, I want you to. But wherever your church is, whether it's the Go Church, or whether it's a church down the road somewhere, then you invite them to come and, and be a part of it. Listen, there's people out there that are hungry for God. Amen. Yeah. There's people out there that don't know nothing about Jesus Christ. And when you begin to talk to them, sometimes I've seen them shivering. And I've heard them say, I'm, I'm having chills. I felt that. There's something, there's something about the, the words you speak and the songs that you sing. And, and it, it's not just a feeling, but it is the anointing of the Holy Spirit as God begins to touch and prick and touch the heart. And God's give you each and each and every one.
one of us that type of ministry to where that we can reach the, the lost. Now, I know I'm going back over things that I've said in the past a lot of times, but I'll hear people say, well, we're going out for the unchurched. We're going for those that, that aren't church. Well, listen, I'm not here to church you. I'm not here to drive you through the church and say you've been churched. I'm looking for the lost. I'm looking for people who do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ. I, I'm not looking for people that don't go to church. I'm, I've heard people say, well, we're, reaching, we're reaching out to the people that have been hurt in church. What? 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 Who hasn't? <laughs> who, who, who hasn't been hurt in the church? I have. Amen. I had my pastor hurt me and made me mad and then hurt me again. <laughs> I thought he walked on water till that day I was standing there listening to all of that. Yeah, I got hurt, but you know what? Put on your big boy panties or your big gal panties. <laughs> Suck it up and go home. God's a good God. That's right, we're international, worldwide, right here on the way. That's right. 32 years ago, the Lord called me into this and gave it to me. And uh, He's my boss. Amen? Amen. Amen. He, he knew what He was getting when He got me. <laughs> Amen? That's right. So they bring this man to Jesus and, and Jesus looks and He sees their faith. And one of the most important things happens in this story. And I'm going to let show this story because I know y'all are tired. This is one of those nights when y'all just look like y'all just, y'all just had it. The humidity is up. It, it's, it's warm. You're sleepy. It's raining. You just want to go home and soak in a hot tub, don't you? That's just what you want to do. Just, just, just soak in the hot tub. But Jesus sees their faith as they lower this man into his presence. And he does the unexpected. He says, Son, thy sins are forgiven. And the religious people of that day, why well, they threw ashes in the air, and it was sackcloth and ashes, rent their clothes, and throw dirt on their head. You know how that goes. When God does something that's unexpected, how many times has the Spirit of God showed up? Uh, I'm talking about the anointed, Holy Ghost power of God showed up in a service, and people that did not were not raised in that, or people that was in a in a traditional church where that that kind of thing didn't go on, they looked back and they went home. It's like Mike said one time: when the power of God is moving. Either two things happen. You either run as fast and hard away from it as you can or you crawl in the middle of it. Amen? And a lot of times people that are religious in their ways when God does something miraculous or out of their line of thinking then all of a sudden they don't know how to receive it. And all of a sudden Jesus looks at this paralyzed man He says, your sins are forgiven. And they're like, well, who, 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 who can forgive sins but God? And so Jesus is sitting there and He's already contemplating what they're thinking. And He said, what is it easier to do? Say, thy sins are forgiven? Or take up thy bed, rise up, take up thy bed and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has power here on the earth. I say unto you, Rise up, take up the bed, and walk. And the man did it. The man picked up his bed and he walked out of that place. Now, remember, this place is crowded. You couldn't get in there, but I guarantee you when this man stood up, wherever he walked, the crowd parted because they had never seen anything like that ever take place. Yes. They wasn't ready to receive it. I've got news. There's a lot of people today in the church that's not ready to receive the things of God. But I tell you what, if you if you will surrender your heart, if you will surrender your heart and say, Jesus, whatever, whatever you want to do in my heart and my life, get ready and hold on. 
and receive what it is, and He will turn your world upside down. Amen. A lot of people think that you just get saved and that's it. You just go through life and all went along. But not only does He save, but He sanctifies and He baptizes with the Holy Spirit and He gives gifts into the body of Christ. And those gifts belong in the body of Christ. They belong to every believer to exercise those gifts, whatever those gifts may be. And we find what it is that, that God is doing in our life. And so He forgives a man of his sins. Now here's, a, here's something. Modern science has proven that that people that are negative, people that are bitter, people that are, are um, unforgiving, that they have a tendency to get sick. You can literally make yourself sick in your spirit and it will affect your body. Yes. Amen. Yes. It will. And one of the first things that needs to happen in a person's life is their sins be forgiven. That's the most important thing there is. And I go to Him every day and I say, Lord, forgive me. I'm sure I committed sins I didn't even know I committed. But I say, Lord, forgive me. Forgive me and give me the strength and the power to walk in You. I, I place my faith in You and what You did at Calvary. And Lord, I ask You to forgive me and wash away my sins by Your precious blood and give me the grace to live for You that I may live my life for You. Listen, living for God is not always easy. It's not always a walk in the park. Sometimes it's a tough old road. And we have valleys and we have peaks. We're up and down, up and down, up and down all the time. We vacillate back and forth in our walk, but the hand of God is steady. He says, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. Just because we don't feel Him doesn't mean He's not with us. We're not judged on our performance of how, good, how much He loves us because He loves us so much that He sent His only Son to die on the cross of Calvary for us that we, He may save us from our sins and forgive us. So the love of God is a consistent thing. Yeah, yeah. And the presence of God is a consistent yeah. thing in our hearts. Yeah. He says, I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you. If He come into your heart and you decided to go out and do something stupid, He doesn't step outside of your heart and say, well, when you come back out that door, I'll rejoin you. No. And listen, we grieve the Holy Spirit a lot of times by what we do and what we say and how we think. We grieve Him. I mean, I wrote a song one time and I thought it was the greatest thing in the world. I blistered the church. I did, boy, I blistered them in this song. I ripped them from one end to the other. Boy, I liked it too. It, Tristan, it had one of these old country twangs to it. You could smell it like a drinking Hank Jr. song. Wailing. Yeah. It was Wailing Jr. and Daniels all put in the war, and I thought, oh my goodness, boy, that right there. Now there's a message right there. Man. Yeah, it was it was good, man. I'd get the old Les Paul and I'd go singing that thing. Boy, it was good. But I took that thing to North Carolina to a conservative church. And I'm in a conservative church. And I thought, Lord, these people will eat this thing up. They liked all the other music that we done. They liked my songs that I've written and I got a hold of that thing. And there were some people that was nodding their head like they liked it. Yeah, get yeah. them! But the Holy Spirit is the one who got me. The Holy Spirit is the one that got me and said, you know what? You need to back up, brother. Not your call. And you've got the wrong spirit with that thing. How many of you know you can have a truth in the wrong spirit? And then you can have the truth in the right kind of spirit. You see, everything that you and I do as a child of God has to be done in love. Every single thing. And it's hard to love some people. It really is. And we have to pray and we have to say, Lord, help me to love them. Help me to love this person that's in front of me. You know, I've had people that were complete strangers in front of me that had a real sincere problem and I could care less. Right. I'm going to be honest, Mike. I, I just really am. 
I've had people that's come up to me and they've just poured their heart out to me with some real problems in their life. And this preacher stood there and could have cared less. I really could have. I'm like, you know, pull up your boots, go on, man, life's tough. But here lately, I've had to say, Lord, help, help me to love them. Help me to have the right kind of spirit. Help me to have the, the love that, that not only will care for this person, but will reach out and take this person by the hand and, and, and pray for them. See, sometimes you've got to be the men hauling the guy in through the roof. Sometimes you've got to be the person that's got a hold of one of the corners of the, of the sheep and, and carrying the people carrying the people in. And, and I'm guilty. I'm guilty a lot of times of missing God because I was so busy doing something that I didn't listen to the Spirit when I was in the grocery store and the person approached me. Or I was at the car wash and somebody walked up to me and, and asked me a question. And then there's been times that the Lord said, pray for that person, and I just flat out said no. Am I the only one in here that's a heathen? I'm wondering if y'all are all looking at me. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. But I look at this story right here, and I think, oh my God. Jesus will do wonderful things in people's lives if we'll just take up our corner of the sheet and bring them to Him. Amen? Amen. Amen. I love you folks. God's a good God. God's a good God. He loves you and I. Amen? Amen. And, and, I, and I want to encourage tonight. I know we got the hometown group here tonight. we got the home, the home folks with us tonight. But I want to encourage us to invite people to come out and to, to be a part of what we're doing here. Minister Christ to people. Tell them about Jesus. Let the Holy Spirit fill you in such a way that you'll talk about Jesus and breathe Jesus and eat breathe, eat Jesus and, and just, just Jesus will just flow from your heart all over them so that we can hear the Word of God and hear His wonderful Spirit that He speaks to us. Amen? Amen. God's good God. Stand with me now all over this place. Let's just bow our heads and close our eyes. Lord, I thank You for everything that You do. And Lord, I'm just asking that You just reach out and, and touch Your people here tonight. Lord, I speak a blessing over the families that are here in the name of Jesus. Lord, touch them. Touch, touch them. Touch me. Touch all of our lives. Lord, that by the power of the Holy Spirit that You would move upon us in a mighty way. Lord, that You would heal our hearts. Lord, that You would heal me. Lord, that You would prick our hearts. Prick my heart, Lord. Lord, that I might walk in in Your wisdom and in Your knowledge, Lord, that You would just touch us in a mighty way. Yes. Let us have a renewal in our spirit, Lord. Let us have a renewal of the fire of the Holy Spirit. Yes. Lord, let us take up our corner of the sheet that, that brought the paralytic man in. Let us take up our part that, that brings the lost in from the highways and the byways and the, and the places, oh God, that, that people are, are hungry and people are, are looking for God and people are reaching for Him. Yes. Lord, that we may use our testimony, oh God. Yes. That we may use what the Lord has done in our life to help someone, oh God. Light a fire in our soul. Yes. Lord, light a fire in our soul. Let it be renewed in our heart and in our spirit, Lord. Let us... Let us talk to our families. Let us speak to the people around us, oh God. Old friends, old enemies, whoever, Lord. God, that You place in our lives and in our heart. Lord, that You would just touch us in a mighty way that we might be a witness for You. Yes, Jesus. Lord, we want to thank You for this. We want to yes. thank You and give You the glory for it. We'll ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. I love you, folks. Y'all turn around and give somebody a hug in this place.